morning. Good morning, Your Honors. Um, my name is Allison Perry, um, and I represent the appellant, the former husband, Carl Will. Um, first, I'd like to start off by asking the court if you received the notice of supplemental authority. I'm sorry it was late. The cases were issued on the 6th and the 8th, and I was out of town last week. Um, we received them. Okay. Thank you. I have extra copies if you needed them. Um, this case involves a, uh, the former husband is appealing the final judgment of a dissolution of marriage. He appeals uh, three issues. The first issue is the imputation of income to the former husband. At the time of the final hearing, the former husband was on disability. He was receiving long-term disability insurance from his um, insurance carrier, and he was receiving Social Security income um, from the Social Security income disability. Um, and that amount was a little over $7,000. The trial court decided to um, impute full-time income to him for his prior employment because he had not been fired from his job and he wanted to go back to work. I say this was um, error because as you know, to impute income to uh, a person for child support and alimony purposes, there is a, a, a two-step process that has to be done and this court, of course, has been clear about that. Um, first, the trial court must conclude that the, ter the, the income the termination of the income was voluntary. And second, the court must determine whether um, the unemployment resulted from the spouse's pursuit of his own interest through less than diligent and bona fide efforts to find employment, um, paying income at a level equal to and better than formerly employed. Um, because this gentleman could appear in court and look like a whole person because his disability is his mental state because he suffered from severe depress depression and he suffered from severe panic attacks. The judge discounted his disability. And well, but didn't the judge also have evidence that he had, this had been an ongoing condition throughout at least his adult life and that he had um, recovered before and been able to work and that the, the, the stress of the dissolution was really the issue, and even the, the, his doctor had pointed to that as the source of his current situation? Well, of course, but that's what modification proceedings are for. You have to, the court needs to make the decision as to what is going on at the time of the final hearing, and at the time of the final hearing, this gentleman was out of work. I mean, he currently is still out of work. Well, he was making 91000 a year in disability, correct? He was making, I believe it was, oh, hold on one second. I'm, I'm sorry, I had those numbers. Yeah, I believe that's correct. Yes, Your Honor. It was 7583 a month. And, and she, and, and, and in, and in, Coming up with an income figure for him, she used the 135,000 that was his base salary. Correct, 11,250 a month. Right, and only and only allowed him um, a $25,000 tax deduction. Didn't allow him to deduct the COBRA payments of $1,500 a month that he was paying for himself and his children, which was an error before he's paying before determining the alimony payment. So this gentleman has like no, the, the, the court didn't take into consideration any of his living expenses prior to determining what he was going to order the husband to pay the wife in alimony. But None. the court did say that this, the, it seems that the former husband needs to decrease his life uh, lifestyle. Well, it, well, exactly, and and they 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 both wanted to. They wanted to sell the house, and it was ordered to to sell the house. But the the house sold March first of this year. 
so w we're talking, you know, several months that the husband was required to pay for the house and all the expenses. So the difference between the 90, we'll call it 90,000 um, and the 135 is, is what is the imputation. Correct. Because although that was his salary, at least base salary at or Oracle at the at his last job, that yes. wasn't what he was making at that point. And your argument is, is that that's what modification proceedings are for? Absolutely. That's exactly what modification proceedings are for. And like you said, the, the court ordered him to reduce his living expenses, but voila, the house doesn't automatically sell just because the court ordered it to. The husband doesn't voila just, you know, cure his mental, his, uh, his depression and his anxiety attacks that were brought on um, in part because of this dissolution proceeding. What do we do with the finding of the neuropsychologist as to intentional use doing poorly on the cognitive functioning that, test because that kind of undercuts the argument. That, that actually you're was a test that was performed because he was concerned both of his parents had Alzheimer's and he actually nursed them through their Alzheimer's until their death. And he was actually concerned, you know, through the discovery process, through uh, you are allowed to get basically all the documents, all your medical documents of your spouse. And this gentleman just went and got that test to make sure he didn't have Alzheimer's because he was frightened because he thought he might have Alzheimer's because both his parents had Alzheimer's. And he did poorly on that test. He had no idea that this test was going to end up in court. So that's how, I mean, that he tested poorly on it. That wasn't put in there. That wasn't done for litigation purposes. He didn't go and seek that to have that introduced into court. That is something that just happened to come in because but he had we, to. But what the problem is, is on appeal, we're stuck with this because the, the trial court relied on this. Uh, correct, but just because you do poorly on a, a test. Intentionally poorly. Um, uh, that, that's a fact that uh, I need help fleshing out with you. Okay, what we, well that. What are we to do with that? The trial court relied on that fact to well, perhaps the, impute income. But the court didn't find that he was intentionally unemployed. The court did not find that he was. That's intentionally right. and that's earning right. and that's the argument that you're making right the and and the the wife didn't challenge that he was that he was faking his depression she didn't say that he was able to work at the time he wasn't working and you have he is like de facto um, disabled because he has the Social Security Administration saying he's disabled, and he has an insurance company saying he's disabled. You know, he didn't have, a, he had his psychiatrist uh, have a letter uh, submitted because his psychiatrist, you know, would not go to court. Um, but, you know, this man is de facto disabled. He wasn't brought to court in a wheelchair, you know, with his legs saying, I can't go work. But mental disability is a disability. I mean, it affects people. You can't work when your brain is not functioning. And um, what about the, um, the depleted assets argument? Depleted assets, that is something that this court has made perfectly clear. The Plitka case is cited in, in uh, my case, in my um, brief, but it, especially the $10,000 for the, uh, the, rafting, the, the trip. rafting trip that was given to the party's daughter before the parties even separated. That was a gift from the, the wife and the um, husband before the parties even separated. That was a marital decision. It just happened that the trip was after the parties got divorced. Well, the judge decided that wasn't a good use of marital funds. Uh, the, that's, in the, that's, not even, that's not an abuse of discretion. That's legal error because that was a marital decision made but during not, the marriage. You specifically carving that out and challenging that. Yeah, I'm, that's one of the things I'm challenging. I thought you were just challenging the big number. 
that number and the 80,000, the 80 plus, it's in the same paragraph, so it's 90. I mean, you're characterizing this as dissipation of assets, and if I'm understanding their argument, their point is, no, that's not what the trial court did. The trial court said this money is unaccounted for. It, there is no proof that it's dissipated, so I'm going to treat it as if you still have it. Okay. Because it's just unaccounted for. In other words, there's no evidence that this was dissipated. And that is not... The husband testified repeatedly, and there are sites in here, that that money doesn't exist anymore, that it has been spent. And the wife... But, but the, he couldn't account for it. Correct, but that is not the standard that we use in marital law cases in Florida. At, the, at trial, um, spouses are not required to account for every cent they spend during a dissolution proceeding. What's required is if a spouse believes that money, marital money has been wasted, that spouse is required to show and prove waste. Well, I think that that's what the court found that she did. The court absolutely did not. The court, when, when a, a spouse says, I do not have this money anymore, it has been spent on living expenses, and it is not in this account. This account does not have that balance anymore. This money is gone. I, I don't exactly know what it was spent on. We have all these expenses. Um, well, he was able to document all the expenses. He documented... He account for this amount of money that was taken out of an American... And the, the judge specifically found that there was not waste. When someone says, I can't account for this money, I don't know where it went, and the judge says, okay, well, it's not waste, but it's not, it's, well, it has. a person in a position to show where it went. That, that, okay, this was a two-year proceeding, I believe, and he could not account for every cent. When well, this was more than just a few dollars. This was a, I a agree. large sum of money that he couldn't account for. And you're saying that he can take 200000 out of a marital account, account for, our, I'm making up numbers, account mm -hmm. for 190000 of it, but there's no explanation of what happened to that other ten. There was 80000 The court can't just assume that he still has it if he can't show what he did with it? No. That's not what the law in Florida is. But the other okay, side so has to prove take, take the marital money, and, and then when you show up at the final hearing, say, I don't know what happened to it. Yes, you have and to so prove the waste. the judge just has to say, okay, well, uh, you can't take that 200000 into account. You have to prove that it's waste or dissipated through waste. That's what the law is in Florida. So the court has to believe that you just don't have it. The other side has to prove that it has been waste. Let me. Well, no, no, no. We're we're not even to the waste. We're we're, we're trying. Here. We're 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 getting to whether he actually still has it, not whether he spent it. You know, frivolously. Okay, I but see where you're going. Yeah, right. that's that's the whole okay. distinction. So you're saying that he still has it, and if he says he doesn't have it, he has spent it on items then can the court say, I don't believe you, I think you still have it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, and that's why in my brief, I did say, here are some items where he testified, I spent it on these things, and no one, and, no one, and, the, and the court did not give him credit for these things that were clearly paid for from these funds, and he wasn't given credit by the court. So some of those items that he paid for um, that were marital expenses that he wasn't given credit for were $10,000, which was the trip. Um, hold on a second. So he wasn't given for, on page 15 in my brief, 
he wasn't given for credit for um, 15 months of $3,352 of family support, which is almost $25,000, past support of $25,000, the wife's attorney fees of $45,000. That leaves only approximately $33,000 of other expenses that the wife stipulated to reasonable. Okay. You've got about five minutes left if you want to okay. save any of that for your rebuttal. Okay, and then the, the last, I, anyway, if you would just review the analysis of, I, I understand what you're saying now. Um, the, the next thing is that the um, insurance, there was no, um, Pleading in the pretrial memorandum for life insurance. Yes, it, in the I, second amended petition, she asked for. I meant life the, insurance. I said the pretrial memorandum that it was going to be something that was discussed in the, at the trial, and there was nothing in the trial um, about life insurance. Well, wait, that doesn't, didn't he have line 65 of his financial affidavit? And it shows he had life insurance. Of his insurance. life insurance, but more is required. You have to testify about the life insurance policy is it still available remember he has health problems and he's not employed at the time of the trial so she has the duty to talk about if he's still insurable and who's going to pay for it and how much is it and this court is very strict about what is required when ordering life insurance what the final judgment um, has to has to contain and this final judgment does not contain it. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Eric Mayer, and I represent the former wife, Lisa Will, who is seated over my right shoulder. Um, beginning with the issue of uh, the imputation of income, it, it is not correct that in order to attribute $135,000 per year to, to the former husband, there had to be a finding that he was voluntarily unemployed. Um, 61.08 of the Florida statutes identifies the various criteria that the court is to use in order to determine the amount of alimony and that includes the earning capacity of the parties and the time that it would take for them to realize that capacity that 61.08 2e now the case is cited in the appellant's brief regarding voluntary requirement that there's a voluntary unemployment. Um, first of all, I'm not, I'm not from this district, but the most useful case is the Alpert case from the second DCA, and it's particularly useful because the court considered two different aspects of, of alimony, one going forward and the other retroactive during the proceeding. And in Alpert, the, the husband, throughout the 22-month proceeding, made significantly less than what the court determined was his historical earnings and his earning capacity. Now, for reasons that could be explained, reasons that were out of his control, as the court, trial court indicated. So, trial court finding that he would be making or he would make approximately $400,000 going forward, that is the amount that was attributed to him, and this court affirmed that. But there now, were some years that the former husband in that case made a million dollars, and so the, the, the imputation of $400,000 was basically sort of a reasonable estimate of everything that he you know, had, had earned in the past. Wasn't that the significance of that? It was sort of an estimate. You take some of the highs, you take some of the lows, and you, c you come up to 400000 Here, there is an imputation of 
basically the highest amount, just about the highest amount of income he had ever had, and just said, this is the number that you can make. So isn't it different from Alpert in that sense? Well, I don't think it's different for two reasons. Number one, the court didn't take the highest amount he was making. Um, the evidence was that 135000 in this case was the base salary with the opportunity to make another $140,000 in commissions. So, and that for the, for the year, for the year that he stopped working, he stopped working six months into the year, he, he would make no less than 180000 for that year based on the commissions that he had already received as well as the base salary. But the, but Albert. And in Albert, he, the guy was still working. I mean, so. I mean, he was still working, and in this case, the evidence indicated that the husband had a job, had a job to go back to. There was a specific salary uh, and compensation attached to that job. The husband said that he intended to go back to work. He said he really wanted to go back to work. He anticipated going back to work. He would go back to work when he was well. But what was the evidence in the record that says, yep, he's going to recover, apart from the fact that this had happened, what, twice previously? And on those occasions, he had gone back. But was there anything in the record? I mean, there's no guarantee that he's going back to work, is there? There's no guarantee that he's going back to work. And that there's nothing in the Certainly. record that says he's going to recover, he's going to be fine. So as much as he might want to go back to work, that's really, I, you know, wishes or horses or whatever the phrase is. And there's, there's nothing to say that he is going to go back to work. Well, well that, sir, there's no guarantee, but, but what we're pinpointing now is really a finding made by the trial court. It, it's not the legal issue of whether... Stay at the podium. I'm sorry, I apologize. It makes our security people really angry. I'm sorry, I'm okay. sorry. Um, so he intends to go back to work, so but that, there's a finding of fact. There's a factual issue that he is going to be able to go back to work, and it's based on his desire. It's based on the letter that his doctor wrote, the disability insurance company, and, there, and based on the fact that he has a job, and no doctor came to court to say that he is not going to be able to continue that job. And I want to correct one statement. He was on long-term disability, but he was not on Social Security, and there's some testimony in the record about some mistakes about, about Social Security uh, letters, and, and the husband testified he, 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 did, he was not Social Security eligible. So that, that's not, and that's at page P245, transcript um, but but the question as to whether the trial court had evidence from which he could determine that this is what the husband makes is distinct from the legal question which is well was it permissible for the trial court to take this finding and attribute this amount of income to him without finding that he was voluntarily unemployed. And that's where Alpert comes in because the two components in Alpert, one was going forward alimony and the other was retroactive. And as far as, as, far as going forward alimony, it was enough that there was sufficient evidence uh, that the court found evidence from which it could determine that it could attribute going forward income of a certain amount to the husband. But when it came to retroactive alimony in Alpert, that is when the court said, no, I, I can't replace 22 months of what he was making with an imputed amount and award it retroactively to wife without finding that he was voluntarily unemployed. So the, 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 the way that those two aspects of alimony were treated in Alpert is very instructive as to uh, under what circumstances it would be required to show voluntary unemployment. And the fact is, nobody is denying that there, is a, there was some kind of um, mental impairment or that it was any less significant than if it were physical. But if, in fact, 
he came into court in a wheelchair and said, I'm not currently working, I'm on disability. But his doctor had written a letter to the disability insurer saying, expect that he's going to continue, he's going to be able to continue working after the divorce proceeding. And no doctor came in and said otherwise, we would be in this exact same position. So nobody is saying that because he, he's claiming a mental impairment that it's not being taken seriously. It, it's not the type of impairment, it's the duration or the expected duration of it. Is that's the issue and that was a factual finding that the court made. And, if in, and as far as, well, that's what modification proceedings are for, which is what my friend said. Well, if in fact the trial court turns out to be wrong and this is not temporary, um, like the evidence showed or like the trial court interpreted, then, then a modification proceeding might be appropriate. And in fact, there, is, there has been one filed for that very reason. As far as the, the dissipation of assets, the evidence was there was $299,000 in a marital account that was taken out of the marital account. Now, if the trial court were well, not I'm going... I'm sorry, let me, I, I apologize. Let sure. me go back for a minute, because you say that th there's a modification proceeding that's been filed, but I mean, but nothing has, and I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking as to how that, the outcome should, should be of that, but you have to show a change of circumstances for modification, right? Well, so, so, what, what's, sure. so what's, what's, the thing, we're, in the, we're in the same circumstances, so isn't it easy as a, as a, and maybe this is just a practical matter that as a legal matter doesn't matter, but at the moment he, he's not employed and he's not making the money. So isn't it easier and more sensible to show a modification when he does go back to work as opposed to just this continuing circumstance that was in effect at the time of the final judgment? Well, he, well he's still not working. He's still not working. Well, what's, I mean, how do you do a modification based on, well, he's still not working because what, the longer he's not working, the less likely it is that he's ever going to go back? I mean, in terms of how this is going to be proven down the road or what when the modification and what grounds should be filed, I just don't understand the rationale of that. Well, I, I mean, I'm not, the point I was making is that there's not a rule that says if, if you're disabled or if you're not making your full amount at the time of trial, then we, we, we can't impute that to you and, we'll, and if... No, clearly. Okay, but, but as far as modification, to get into that, the fact is that requires a permanent change in circumstances. And if the trial court made a determination at the trial that, that this affliction is, that keeps him from working at the job that he holds is uh, temporary, then if it becomes beyond temporary, then, then yeah, that would be an appropriate time for the husband to modify. So I don't think that, you know. But meanwhile, he's not making the income. So. Well, the trial court had, didn't believe him as well. I mean, that is part of what's going into this and that and, and um, talked about the, the testing. There, there is the trial. That, that is the trial court's function to make that determination of whether he works, whether he can work, and or, or and in fact didn't believe that either didn't believe that this was genuine, and I don't think that's the case, but believe that it was something that w was not a permanent was was not a permanent issue, and that that's just a factual finding, and that's based on. Well, one thing, the absence of any uh, medical evidence that he couldn't work, and the fact that the one doctor that was heard from via letter to an insurance carrier said that he expects that he will continue to work out after, the, after the thing that has caused or triggered this affliction has ended, which but, is but the that divorce thing proceeding. But existed um, prior to the petition for dissolution being filed in this case under the record evidence with 
um, missing work at least two other times for these, the same condition, didn't he? He, right, he, yes. And, uh, he had temporary, temporary bouts yeah. that caused him to miss work previously. And it's difficult to discern you know, the law to me, even under the best discretionary basis that when an individual who um, has been uh, deemed to suffering with any disability has hope to return to work, that that hope should be um, um, applied against the person. I mean, I hope to return to work, I want to return to work, but if you're able to and actually do, are really the only relevant factors for the, the imputation of income, aren't they? Not voluntarily well, being underemployed. No, I, I, I agree with that. I, I, don't, I agree with that. And, and, nobody, and my point is, he d there's n doesn't need to be a finding that he's voluntarily unemployed, but, but the evidence was that he had a job. The evidence that was that he currently wasn't working at that job, but he could have brought in uh, evidence that says he's going to continue to be unable to uh, work at his job, and he didn't do that. He just brought in evidence that says, I, I'm, on, I'm on a uh, private disability insurance policy now. Um, but but he, he still had a job, and the, the trial court, that, that, I, that was... The evidence supports the trial court's attribution of 135,000 to him, not because he, not merely because he said, "Oh, I would like to go back to work," but he so said he has he, a burden of production. What, what do you well, I, I think that <laughs> well, I think that he can't shift the burden to us. He had a job. He has a job, and if he wants to come in and say. I am permanently. He had I am a job as present tense. I am permanent. He did have a. He, so he held a job. He held a job, but he was on disability. Correct. correct? He okay. had a job. He testified that mm -hmm. he had a job to go, that he could go back to when he was ready to go back to it. Uh, he didn't present any evidence indicating that he couldn't. He, the evidence he presented was that he hasn't been able to, and he doesn't know if he's going to be able to. Um, so. No, it's not, it's not a matter of saying, if I hope to, that means I will, but, but there was su sufficient evidence for the trial court to determine that he is going to do that, just like the trial court in Alpert was able to say, and, and I, I don't agree that it was necessarily saying, oh, I'm going to average various years and come out with 400,000. The trial court in Alpert very, very clearly said, you haven't been making money for these 22 months, but there are specific reasons, and, uh, and they're beyond your control, so we're not going to continue and, and attribute to you only the income that you've been earning during this 22-month period. It wasn't a matter of averaging. It was a matter of, I, I think it was exactly what the judge did in this case. It was a conservative attribution. Yes, he... In Alpert, he had made over a million dollars in certain years, and now, conservatively, the court was only going to attribute four hundred thousand dollars to him. Here, the husband, the husband, in this case, made more money than than a base salary, but that is conservatively what the trial court decided to impute to him. I want to ask you a question, uh, Ms. Perry listed some specific expenses that she contends the were not that the husband was not given credit for that he established at trial um, can you speak to that please really I can't speak to the exact math what I can speak to is I, I don't I, b I believe that that the, the what was appealed the issue was well does the trial court have to find that there was misconduct in order to in order to um, assign a certain portion of these no longer existing assets to the husband and the answer is the trial court didn't the trial court the husband moved three hundred thousand dollars if the trial court were to ignore the law that Ms. Perry says exists about well you can't you can't just uh, attribute these funds to him 
unless there's misconduct, then the trial court would have, would have assigned him the whole 300000 But instead, the trial court took every bit of money, putting aside the $10,000 for the rafting trip, every bit of money that was, that was accounted for and, and did, not, did not assign that as part of the husband's equitable distribution. The only thing that was assigned was money that was removed from the marital account without the, without the wife's knowledge and never accounted for. So th there is no requirement. Uh, the requirement is that you can't, is that if there's assets that, that don't exist, you, you, you can't assign those. But there was no evidence that, that th those money was spent. And that's exactly what the trial court said, is that there's not evidence that this money was dissipated. It doesn't say there's no evidence that, that this money wasn't dissipated for improper purposes. He said there's no evidence that it was dissipated at all. So, but I, but no, I, I, I don't, you know, and this really wasn't, no, as far as the math goes, I wasn't really prepared to address the math. Okay, that's fine. You've got about a minute if you want to wrap up. Okay. Um, the insurance requirement, as was pointed out, it, it, it was specifically pled. Um, but you'll agree that the trial court didn't make any findings and there wasn't any evidence as to what was available, what the cost was, et cetera. Well, the evidence, the evidence that actually an insurance policy existed, um, and that was in the financial affidavit, um, but yes, well I agree that there was not specific as to how much it would cost to acquire another policy, um, but but there was certainly evidence that supported supported the requirement and the amount. In the case of Richardson versus Richardson, which is cited in the briefs, 900 Southern Second 656, um, Second DCA 2005, talk about the special circumstances that that are required in order to impose this type of requirement and I'm quoting it says inc they include a spouse potentially left in dire financial straits after the death of the obligor spouse due to age ill health and or lack of employment skills obligor spouse in poor health minors living at home supported spouse with limited earning that's capacity that's I mean, that's only one of the required findings, right? I mean, and of, all, and of all of the findings, that's the one that would be easiest to discern from the record, even absent a finding by the trial court. But I what about the other requisite findings? Requisite findings regarding the amount, how much it would cost? The court has to make specific evidentiary findings as to the availability and cost of insurance, the former husband's ability to pay, in addition to these special circumstances. The, the evidence, aside from the fact that he had a policy in place at the time, the he trial court the, the trial court indicated in in uh, well, even in the order on rehearing when this was brought right. to her attention, she couldn't make the finding. Correct. He stated that he had considered these things, but he didn't make any further specific findings. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Right. At the end of your time. Thank Perry? you. Ma'am. Um, first, the husband did qualify for Social Security. He's on Social Security. I do n that wasn't in dispute. Those page numbers do not state that. Um, instead, those page numbers, T245 uh, and 246, actually state that the last time the husband was on disability, his disability lasted two years and a year and a half. So... That is actually helpful for the husband since, you know, his disability started six months into the dissolution proceeding and therefore his disability, his severe depression and anxiety attacks are not going to magically disappear upon his um, being granted a divorce. Um, he also, the did, am I correct, did, did, 
the opposing counsel bring up that there's a modification action pending? We're not going to consider okay. that. Okay. Okay. Um, also, the fact that experts were not brought in to go on and on about the husband's um, disability. I mean, this court is has, you know, the Rona case. Let's don't get Rona fever and spend all the money that's needed for uh, these parties' children. Uh, I didn't, it doesn't appear it was necessary since the Social Security Administration and private um, insurance company had found that this man is disabled and entitled to um, benefits because of his disability. So the fact that more experts didn't come in and say, yes, he's disabled, he cannot work, should not be held against him. Um, his, the gentleman's, the husband's financial affidavit shows that he had over $16,000 a month in expenses. He was only getting a little over $7,000 a month. So clearly the money had to come from somewhere, which is why the money was dissipated and the money was spent. He couldn't account for every cent because he was spending money on yard care, pool care, fixing the fence. I have a list in the initial brief on page 16, 15, 16, 17. Okay, well that was quick, five minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you, you Your Honor. quite five minutes. Oh, I didn't, okay. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. You.